good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the second event in the Spring 2020 uh, series of the City Talks on the theme of changing memory scapes in the city. My name is Ruben Rose Redwood, and I'm an associate professor in geography at the University of Victoria, and also the chair of the Committee for Urban Studies that puts on uh, the City Talks lecture series. And I'd like to begin by first acknowledging with respect um, the Lekwungen people on whose traditional territory um, the, this event is taking place, as well as acknowledge the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples whose historical relations with the land continue to this day. I'd also like to acknowledge the financial support of the Faculty of Social Sciences, as well as a range of departments including geography, history, political science, as well as the School of Environmental Studies and the Gustafson School of Business who are all supporting uh, the City Talks this year. And this year, in fact, is the 10th anniversary of the City Talks lecture series. Uh, and so if you're interested in supporting the City Talks, you can go to our website at thecitytalks.ca. Uh, if you'd like to be a donor or co-sponsor, we, uh, we do have some funds, but we could always use a little bit more to put on the, the series. Uh, and so tonight, it's really my, my pleasure to welcome you all uh, to, uh, to introduce uh, and introduce tonight's speaker, Nadine uh, Nakagawa, uh, who's a community organizer uh, and local activist uh, and uh, city councilor in New Westminster. Uh, and uh, her work uh, you know, uh, relates to a variety of issues, including housing, public spaces, reconciliation, public engagement, and child care. For her work um, in the community, Nadine was named the 2017 Citizen of the Year uh, uh, at the Chamber of Commerce Platinum Awards. Uh, and she runs a consulting, consulting uh, service called Ablaze. Uh, and holds a master's degree from uh, in interdisciplinary studies from Royal Rose University. Tonight, Nadine will be uh, discussing the recent removal of the statue of Judge Matthew Begbie from the provincial courthouse uh, in New Westminster in, in 2019, uh, which was a motion that she brought before uh, city council, uh, as well as uh, how various efforts to remove and recontextualize colonial monuments provide an opportunity uh, to decolonize urban public spaces in Canada and to, tell, and, and to serve as a means of telling a more complex uh, history. Uh, so tonight her talk is entitled uh, Memories in Stone, uh, Confronting Colonial Monuments. Uh, so let's give Nadine Nakagawa a nice warm welcome to the City Talks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So really nice to be here in your community. Um, I have the great pleasure of being an elected city councillor in New Westminster. Um, I'm a settler. I'm the first millennial ever elected, um, an elder millennial, but that means that I'm currently the youngest serving member. Um, along with my colleague, Chidi Doss, I'm also one of the first people of color ever elected to New Westminster City Council. And that was in, <laughs> I think so, it was in 2018. And that's a story into itself. Um, I'm the only renter on council. Um, the reason why I tell you these things is because perspectives matter. So I'm going to return to this a little bit later on, but I will say that I'm an intersectional feminist, which means that I believe in situated knowledge. Situated knowledge means that what I know, what you know, reflects our cultural, um, historical locations. There's no such thing as objective knowledge in my opinion. So it's really important to tell you who I am and what perspectives I bring to this conversation. Let's talk a little bit about where New West is situated. So New Westminster has the somewhat unique uh, placement of being at the intersection of a number of different nations. This is probably because of the location along the Fraser River. In the Halkomenum language, New Westminster was known as the resting place. I don't have the least hesitation to tell you that in New West, we're quite far behind in reconciliation efforts. Uh, we were the first provincial capital before Victoria, something that people in the US haven't let go of, we're still holding a bit of a grudge, some of us. Um, and as a historical capital, a lot of the racist actions against indigenous and uh, racialized people originated from the US, so there's a lot of work there still to do. The land where the US is on is claimed by a number of different nations. The Kakite, which is a small landless nation that was declared extinct before Chief Ronda Larrabee reclaimed her heritage. The Musqueam, Swamish, Tsleil-Waututh, the Katsi, Kwantlen, Stolo, the Kukwetlam, and potentially even other nations for whom colonialism has attempted to erase their connection with the land. There aren't any reserves in the West. So 
So I named these nations not only because it's important to, to name the nations that are te that, whose territory we're on, but also to highlight the complexity of Indigenous relationship to land and the difficulties that a colonial worldview has imposed. So often uh, colonialism, you know, we think that a square of land can only belong to one family, a business, the government, um, and that tenure is fixed. I also name these nations to highlight that if we acknowledge that land is unceded, we often say we're on unceded territory, then it means that this land is stolen. And that's even a bit of a cop-out, because stolen by whom? It was stolen by settlers, by colonizers, by the government, and really that's, that's us. So that means that we have to have a real conversation about giving land back. But I wasn't invited to talk here about giving land back, but sometimes I think that's what the conversation really should be. Uh, this conversation is about public spaces and places, and it's about monuments. New Westminster was built on a hill, and the provincial courthouse is at the bottom of the hill, and it's flanked by a, a grand concrete staircase. Standing guard in front of that staircase in the courthouse was a statue of Judge Matthew Bailey Bay. Judge Bagby became the first Chief Justice of the Crown Colony of British Columbia, and he served from 1858 to 1866. After his death, he became known as the Hanging Judge, and we have a pub in the US that's named after him, and their tagline is, let's hang. Uh -huh. Yeah, not kidding. Uh, if you look at Bagby on Wikipedia, you will see mention that he rode around the province on horseback, he sang opera, interesting facts. You'll also find significant space given to his conviction of a white man, William Marshall, for assaulting a First Nations man based solely on the testimony of First Nations people. That First Nations man and those First Nations people are named. He's also credited with speaking several languages and he conducted trials in Aboriginal languages with, without the use of interpreter, which as it turns out is likely Chinook jargon, which is a pidgin trade language spoken throughout the Pacific Northwest. So what I'm trying to suggest here is an aggrandizing of Bambi's language. There's also two lines on the fact that in 1864, he presided over the murder trial of five Silkwood men. They were found guilty and sentenced to hang. There's also two lines on the British government, British Columbian government, exonerating what they referred to as six Silkwood chiefs. So, in other words, his singing opera and riding around the province on horseback was as notable as an act that deeply impacted the Silkwood nation, and in fact changed the trajectory of colonization in this. Here's what my motion said about this history. Whereas in 1864 at Quinell, in the colony of British Columbia, Judge Matthew Bagby resulted over the trial that resulted in the wrongful hanging of the five so-called team chiefs, and whereas in 1865 Chief Ahan was also wrongfully hanged in Westminster, and whereas the so-called team chiefs who are at war with the colony of British Columbia were deceived into meeting the colonial government for the purpose of peace talks, and where, whereas in 2014, the British Columbian government apologized to the Silkwood Nation for hanging the chiefs, and whereas in 2018, the government of Canada exonerated the chiefs, and whereas the Judge Bagby statue is a symbol of the colonial era and this grave injustice, and whereas the execution of the six Silkwood chiefs changed the relationship and was used as a threat to all indigenous people attempting to defend their lands. So I took this motivating language from the government of Canada's exoneration of the six chiefs. So it wasn't something that I, I originated. So as, as I'm alluding to, and as was mentioned, in May of 2019, I co-sponsored a motion to remove the Bagby statue. And some people in the community and some people who I've known throughout my campaign were taken aback by this action because I previously said that I didn't have an opinion on the Bagby statue. And in fact, what I think about it doesn't matter. That's still true. This action was in response to the Silk Routine National Government calling for the statue to be removed. They made this call in 2016 after the Law Society removed their judgment and statue. It took us three years to respond. As many people also likely know, the UVic Law School took actions to remove Bagby from their organization. In a four to two vote, council supported the motion and the statue was removed in July. This is a quote from the Silk Routine from the Silk Routine National Government's press, re press release following the removal. From the Silk Routine perspective, Judge Bagby represents a legacy of betrayal, pain, and tragedy for our people, said Chief Joel Fons, Tribal Chair of the Silk Routine National Government. Removing Judge Bagby's statue from public spaces does not remove him from history, but rather recognizes our history and our 
our experience as Indigenous peoples. We are grateful for the leadership shown by the New Westminster City Council and for the understanding and compassion for our people that this decision makes. I could stop right now because to me, that's what really matters. The Silkotine people, as well as urban Indigenous people, said that they were harmed by the statue, so we removed it. But this is when settlers began to care about Reiki statue. Of all the names I was called after this, after this story was covered across the country, the most creative might be an intimidating arbiter of moral fashion. Uh, but the clear winner for Choice Insult was, you're an idiot. And I received a lot of those. A couple of days before the motion was made public, the mayor suggested that I prepare some speaking points for, for talking to the media. And in my naivety, I believed that the media interest would be isolated to our local paper. And in fact, all the major outlets covered this story. First, that there was a motion to remove it, that we voted to remove it, and that we did, in fact, remove the statue. They covered it three times. And the story just really wouldn't go away. What the media didn't cover was the full motion, which included an aspect of consultation to better tell the full history of the Chipotle War. And yet, each time I did an interview with media, they would ask me whether or not this motion was erasing history. I have to say that it strikes me as incredibly ironic that thousands and thousands of years of Indigenous history have been erased. That the government tried to erase the history of residential schools. And in fact, until quite recently, many people, including Indigenous people, didn't know the violence that the government had inflicted on their ancestors. Where were the history defenders' demands to preserve that history? Where is the outrage that the indigenous histories have been erased from the lands in the West? In fact, I suspect based on the blatant racism in many of the emails that I received, it's those same people telling indigenous people to get over it. This is revisionist history, the detractors yell. And to that I say, Canadian history is revisionist history. The question for me, is whose history matters? Whose stories are worth preserving? And is there really only one true telling of history that we all need to agree upon? Remember, perspectives matter. Some people have commented to me that it would have been better to keep the statue and contextualize it. We could have put up a plaque, we could have added something to the statue to nuance the history. And perhaps we could have. But who would have decided that one? Who would have decided what it would have been appropriate in that space? Again, the same question. Whether we remove the statue, add to the statue, is about decision making and whose perspectives matter. I want to linger on this point for a moment. Prior to being elected to council, I didn't see work on reconciliation happening in the West. It's one of the main reasons why I ran in the first place. But before that, in 2017, um, I co-organized a series of events to try and prompt conversation on reconciliation in the community. So with Haley Sinclair and Babs Kelly, I organized a public dialogue at our local conference center, the Angle Center, that platformed four Indigenous people who spoke about what reconciliation meant to them. Harlan Pruden, Josh Dolling, Toitanat Siswise, and Tasha Webb. It was moderated by Dave Seaweed from Douglas College and with music from Eden Fine Day. The event was attended by all of the council at the time, and the MLA, and about 300 members of the community, and it really did start a conversation. We followed that up with a series of kitchen table dialogues using the toolkit from Reconciliation Canada. And then after gathering reflections from all of those events, we presented a report to council with some recommendations. For me, these, these events were about dialogue and about listening, but there's, Two things that really stood out for me from going through this process. Number one, urban indigenous people said that the presence of the statue hurt them. It symbolized the legacy of colonization in residential schools. It didn't just symbolize it, it celebrated it. Its presence reinforced that the city did not care about them or their well-being. As my friend Rhiannon Bennett, who's Musqueam, said to me just after the removal, why would anyone support celebrating the perpetrators of genocide? The other thing that stood out to me was any time I talked about the reconcili this reconciliation work or the process of organizing these dialogues, white men would come up to me and tell me that they wanted a seat at any table working on reconciliation in the West. At the time, 
I wasn't on city council, I was not the decision maker on any of these tables and who would sit at them. But on several occasions, settlers felt that it was necessary to let me know that they wanted their voices and their opinions centered in whatever process the city developed. I'm going to linger a little bit longer on this point, both these voices matter. If you can't tell by my last name, I'm Japanese Canadian, and Hava, which means mixed race. The BC government is currently undertaking consultation on what would be an appropriate apology for Japanese internment during the Second World War. My grandmother, Kuniko Nakagawa, was interned at Popoff, uh, which is in the Kamis. She was separated from my grandfather, who was sent to work on road camps. She's still alive, she's in her mid-90s, she's sharp as a tack and really adorable. Um, but what I will say is that what she thinks is an adequate apology is more important than what any non-Japanese Canadian person thinks. And I would even go so far as to say that if you're white and your family has no history of internment, then I don't think your opinion matters at all. Does that hurt? Is it offensive to be told that your opinion on an issue isn't needed? Maybe it is, maybe it does. But I would invite us to consider both the explicit and implicit ways that we communicate that to members of our community. The ways in which we prioritize and center certain types of people and marginalize others. Can you see it? If you can't see it, it might be because you're in the center. And maybe one of the ways that we do this, that we tell people they don't matter, is ignoring them when they tell us that they're harmed by something in a public space, like a statue. Have you ever been in a public space and felt not welcome by the built environment? Have you ever looked around your city or community and thought, this does not right reflect my experience, my history, or my life? The stories we tell about our community, are these your stories? Do they reflect your understanding of our shared story? And on the other side, have you ever considered the ways in which the city is built for you, does reflect you, and who that may exclude? The fact is, history is not objective, but too often we treat it like it is. Look at the way that Bagby's Wikipedia page is written, and I know Wikipedia is not academic history, but the fact is, is when people heard about this story both in the US and across the country, where did they go to find information about Bagby? Wikipedia or academic journals? So how the writers of that article prioritize some so-called facts, like singing opera, over others shows a clear bias in the way that the writers of that article wanted to be true. And I hate to break it to everyone, but these type of biases exist in academia too. Beyond that, it's clear that settlers and indigenous people have a very different historical tone of judgment. For the traditional writers of British Columbia history, the settlers, Bagby was the first chief justice. He was rugged, he was a bit quirky. His personality was more interesting than the job that he, or more interesting than his record, because he was just doing his job, but the job for which he's been memorialized. For the Silk team, he's the person who helped lure their war chiefs into what they thought were peace talks, tried them, hung them, and then sending their, their community into disarray and threatening their connection to the land. And you know, I think it's really important to mention at this point that if you're not familiar with Delta Move, it's really important to look that up, because it's about Gitsan and Wet Suotan, which is exactly what's happening now. And while you're at it, look up Silco Team Nation versus British Columbia government. Because it's all about tenure and, and being on the land. And this is exactly what the government is always trying to do, is remove indigenous people from the land. So which telling the settlers or the indigenous peoples receive more prominence? Which is true? Which is important? And are either of these histories incorrect? To add another layer onto this, Begge has been heralded for his tolerance towards the Chinese community. He said that the four prominent qualities of the Chinese were industry, economy, sobriety, and law abidingness. And he also set aside challenges to Chinese laundry and pawn shops. So there's a story to be told there too, but does it center Chinese voices? For me, this is about continued control over public spaces and control over future narratives. If we are contextualizing historical figures, who's next? But by contesting narratives, we can test the mythology that we've been taught about Canada. And if we do that, if we recognize we're on stolen land, what does 
represent. I want to talk for a minute about the placement of the Begbie statue. So I mentioned that it was placed in front of the law courts. We know that Indigenous people are overrepresented in all negative stats, homelessness, overdose deaths, and yes, incarceration rates. The courthouse in the US is also home to the first Indigenous court in the province, and it opened in 2006. That's only 10 years after the last residential school was closed. The Indigenous court does not conduct trials, but instead aims to provide support and healing to assist in rehabilitation and to reduce recidivism, while also acknowledging and repairing the harm done to victims in the community. Their focus is collaborative and holistic, recognizing the unique circumstances of Indigenous offenders within the framework of existing laws. In other words, it's a form of restorative justice and it diverts people out of the criminal justice system. So we have a restorative justice court that involves elders, and the people attending the court had to walk by the banking statue in the way. So are these places neutral? I would argue that the baby statue was in a place of power in front of the courthouse. It was a bit of a flex. It wasn't simply a reflection of the past, but it was a reflection of our current state and the future. That's what public spaces are. So back to the question about adding a plaque that can recontextualize the monument. That's one idea. Another idea is adding huge monuments of the six chiefs and circling Becky. Would that have been the right move? I'll go back to the place. This is in front of the courthouse. People, and again, disproportionately Indigenous people, go to the courthouse at their most vulnerable moments, either as victims or accused of crimes. Is this the right place to explore the complexity of colonization and the Japan War? I'm not against having the Yankee statue in context, whether in the form of art or description elsewhere, but I do not think that it's appropriate in front of the courthouse. Perhaps we can find another place, like a museum. Remember the list of nations from the beginning of my talk? The Kakai, Musqueam, Squamish, Slewitu, Kansi, Stolo, Kwan, and Kapa'o? If this is their territory, should we be adding monuments of non Salish chiefs to their territory? What do their chiefs and bound councils have to say about this? Reconciliation isn't easy. That's a bit of a bit of a cop out right now. But in trying to do right by the Soko team, we can't perpetuate harm on the local First Nations who claim the territory. Their desires for the land must be considered and centered. I see removing colonial monuments very differently than I see adding statuary, even if it's an attempt to reconcile. While the Sokoti Nation asked us to remove the statue, I'm still interested in what an alternative could have been, and whether it be appropriate in a less powerful place. What would artists and activists do to confront this statue? So I've looked at a couple different statue interventions uh, from around the world. This picture isn't sideways. Uh, this is a replica of the Edward VII Equestrian statue that's been standing in Queen's Park in Toronto since 1969. It's a life-size replica made of uh, styrofoam and wood. The artists, Amy Lamb and John McCurley, set the replica floating down the Dome River. This image is from the University of North Carolina, where students are protesting a statue of Silent Sam. The statue was erected by the United Daughters of Confederacy in 1913. And when the statue was unveiled, a Confederate veteran and University of North Carolina trustee named Julian Carr gave what has now been described as a white supremacist speech. The statue was later pulled down by protesters. The governor, who had previously called for the removal of monuments, criticized the action, saying, the governor understands that many people are frustrated by the pace of change, and he shares their frustration, but violent destruction of public property has no place in our community. But I guess the harm of racist systems and policies are less concerning. My words, not this. This one might strike a little home, uh, close to home for people in Victoria. This is from Regina, where Patrick Johnson, a settler, painted the John A. McDonald statue. He was charged with mischief. Johnson said this wasn't mischief, it was a statement. I wanted to correct the history of the monument and also of the space, he said. I wanted to create a safe space for which people of all races could come to without seeing a symbol of their oppression. 
this one is again from the Edward VII statue in Queen Park. It's called Where Once Stood a Bandstand for Cruising and Shelter from 2017. It was performed by Hazel Meyer and collaborators from Wayne Blanche Toronto. It was originally supposed to be placed over the King Edward VII statue, but for logistical reasons they had to move it. But I think this one's particularly interesting because it highlights different history in all this piece. Uh, and in this case, queer histories. Uh, this one's called uh, Jeff Captain James Crook, and it's by artist Jason Wayne. This is performance art from Kingston. It's called Dear, Lu Dear John, Louis David Riel. It's by Métis artist David Garneau as part of curated Aaron Sutherland's Talking Back to Johnny Mac performance series. And it was intended to intervene in the official celebration of Johnny McDonald's uh, 200th birthday. Uh, this is a really well-known one. It's from uh, Roads Must Fall in South Africa, Cape Town University in 2015. And this is a Cecil Rose statue, of course. The campaign started when Chimani Maxwell threw a human excrement onto the statue of Rhodes because he saw it as a symbol of the colonial history that South Africa is still dealing with. Sound familiar? The protesters were criticized for their tactics. That also sounds pretty familiar to me. Once the statue was removed, there was a play written about Rhodes Must Fall, so art about the process of removing the statue. Um, this is a local one called We Come to Witness, Sonny Asu and Dialogue with Emily Carr. Um, this is from uh, Asuncion, and it's uh, basically they took the statue of the former dictator and put it between two blocks of cement. Um, this one is a bit weird to me, I'm going to talk about it a little bit. So this is a uh, performance on the Whitman statue at Whitman College in Walla Walla, Oregon. The performance took place from November 11th to 17th, or 11th to 15th, and was meant to parody the African cleaning. The intention was to engage the Whitman community in a discussion about the ongoing legacy of settler colonialism and genocide on campus. It was coordinated by the students in the art and the anthropocene. The performance piece included a manifesto authored by the class as a collective, which outlines an open framework through which to engage with the piece both ideologically and physically. Rather than being a restrictive set of guidelines, it was meant to be a means by which people could engage in conversation. So this one prompts a couple of questions for me. Number one, were there indigenous people in this class? And how were their perspectives and safety taken into account? Did the class consider the harm that discussions about colonization could have on Indigenous students and members of the community? <coughs> I'm thinking about when the report on the Murder and Missing Indigenous Women report uh, was released, and Canada jointly discussed, uh, engaged in a discussion about the use of the word genocide. It was very clear to me the harm that this caused particularly on Indigenous women. Many of my friends sort of just collapsed in dismay having to, having to watch these discussions. My last question is, what impact is this meant to have? How does it make spaces com more comfortable or safer for Indigenous and marginalized members of the community? I'm a campaigner. I've, I've worked on a number of political and issue-based campaigns, and I'm always interested in outcomes. What are you hoping your actions will achieve? It's not always necessary to know. You can have an iterative process, but it is also worth consider always worth considering. Will this action lead to the outcome that you're looking This one's also of particular interest to me because it's in the West, uh, but also for several, several different reasons. That's the Simon Fraser bust, and it's right on the Fraser River. The red line above, um, around the pedestal is an intervention by artist Natty Leach. Her proposal was actually to cut out that piece and float it down the Fraser River. She received consent from the New York City Council, but it was, getting, it was contingent on getting support from the local First Nations. They didn't oppose her doing it, but they just weren't interested in engaging with her on it, perhaps because it didn't matter to them. Part of this project, called Lowering Simon Fraser, <coughs> highlighted the fact that this bus had been moved several times. And each time it was moved, the plinth it was on was shortened, and it was moved to a lower place in the city. Remember, Newest is basically a giant hill. So it started off on this great big pedestal at the top of the hill, then it was moved down the hill a little bit, 
that is still shortened. And now it's right on the banks of the Fraser, and it's on a relatively short, uh, short pedestal. So it really highlights the fact that monuments aren't fixed in the way that we currently imagine them to be. I attended a dialogue session presented by the artist on this project. And she talked about how when she was painting the red line on the pedestal, multiple people challenged her on it. And eventually the police were called. She had permission, so it was fine. I'd also mention that Maddie Leach is a white woman from New Zealand. I've led several public art projects in the city that have begun with me and an artist late at night, drawing outlines on public spaces in the city, like really just taking a sharpie and, and writing all over them, marking them up in a sort of way that looks like graffiti. They include a wall in downtown New West, almost right across from the police station, a public washroom building in a well park, even a fire station. It was dark out, but each time people saw us and we were never challenged. People just seemed to assume that we had the right to do it, or they didn't care that we were doing it. Very interesting that when you touch a piece of statue, the police are called right away. So I wanted to highlight how these various statue and art interventions to show that there definitely are ways in which artists and activists have confronted colonial monuments. But in the US, that's not what we chose to do. Begbie probably wasn't the worst person in the world for the job of Chief Justice. He's quoted as saying, it seems horrible to hang five men at once, especially under the circumstances of their capitulation. The death penalty was automatic. But again, which parts of the history are most important? By all accounts, Begbie wouldn't have even wanted to be memorialized in this way. Apparently, he wanted no other monument then a wooden cross be erected on my grave. That there be no flowers, no inscription, but my name. Dates of birth and death, and Lord be merciful to me, a sinner. And if Begbie didn't want this monument, who else is hurt by removing the statue? Were settlers harmed by this? I have to say that I very sincerely doubt it. The story of the Begbie statue isn't over. We still need to talk about where I'll go, how it'll be presented. But even before that, we need to decide who gets to decide. Whose voices matter on this? And I hope we can agree that those most affected should be the ones who are consulted and whose voices are centered. And I hope we can learn together. The statues are not how we learn our history history books, Wikipedia articles, and stories are how we learn our history. There's a wonderful quote that I want to interweave here um, from a CDC panel. And I'm sorry, I, my download didn't get hurt, the name of the woman. Um, but she, uh, it was actually about the Johnny McDonald statue removal, and she had a really wonderful uh, comment about uh, what she thought of it. She said, we need to raise the consciousness of our country to move beyond reconciliation as something that's appeasing to Indigenous people. We need to, to take responsibility for the fact that our narrative about Canada isn't true. It's based on racism and dehumanization of Indigenous people. We tell a story that Johnny MacDonald is the founder of Canada, that Confederation is the moment of Canada's birth. Our treaties are the moments of Canada's birth. And she talks a bit about how there's treaties between uh, settlers and Indigenous people, but also between different First Nations, and in fact, Treaties that don't even involve people in the world at all. They're treaties of, of the natural earth. Um, one of her co-panelists also made a comment that what is really erasing history is taking uh, hundreds of thousands of indigenous kids and not teaching them their culture or their language. That is a true erasure of history. So, you know, I say that the days of walking through our communities and not noticing is over. We have to notice the names, uh, the names of our streets, of uh, the public places, the statues, and even public buildings that are built, uh, you know, named after people who have donated money without considering the provenance of that wealth. Uh, we have to continue to center Indigenous people and all, all, all marginalized people who do not see themselves centered in our history or represented in any way. And I'll just end with this image. In U.S. Minster, uh, we are the colonial capital, original capital. Um, and often we talk about uh, the founding of the city as the moment when the sappers or the royal engineers come. And in fact, there are thousands of years of Indigenous history long before the sappers ever, ever landed on that territory. 
And uh, when we talk about history, we need to talk about their history.
ask them, can I ask, do they ask demographic questions in the? Yeah, that's in that is part of the generally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it's not like they don't know who they're asking mm -hmm. at certain times. Mm -hmm. But when you mentioned that you know there's some opinions that are kind of less like they they aren't important things certain in certain conversations. Mm -hmm. You know when it's somebody's time to say something, then. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. Like, I'm an able-bodied person, so asking me about disability and inclusion is really not not relevant. Um, and in fact, I think it's I think it's actually quite harmful to ask people who are continuously centered to again comment on that because it it can distill or erase. Um, and when we continue to to center certain voices, it does marginalize others. So. Um, yeah, I, can, I completely agree with you. I think that we need to be incisive and really, we need to know who we need to hear from and then ask them the right questions. And in fact, um, ask them what we don't know to ask them because often that is, that's a bigger problem is that we don't know what we don't know. I, I kind of wonder if there's a, another mode that I'm not getting mm -hmm. in the, in the, in the survey. We don't live in a world in which we don't live in a democracy in which we vote on everything. We don't live in a participatory 
territory of democracy. We live in a democracy in which a certain proportion of people, mm -hmm. and at the local level, I'm not sure what the voter turnout is here, mm -hmm. but about 26% of the population, I think, in the US voted in the election that I was elected. So that's a very small proportion of people. And if we look at who those people are, you know, we get a bit of a lay of the land of where the voter turnout comes from. It's the most affluent neighborhoods that turn out to vote. And my neighborhood, the Brown of the Hill, which is uh, the rental neighborhood, is low income, a lot of newcomers, a lot of seniors. That neighborhood has the lowest voter turnout. And um, what does that mean? It means that people who are, are constantly uh, disenfranchised um, are less likely to come vote because they do not see themselves reflected, they don't see their issues reflected, and when they do raise their voices, they don't necessarily get to see that people are responding. So I think that we have to counterweight those systems of some people feel, like when people come to the city of New West, predominantly homeowners. Renters are very, very underrepresented in city processes or city engagement. Uh, racialized people, very, very underrepresented. People with disabilities, young people. So I think, and I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with saying that whoever comes and speaks, their voices count. That, that's not how I think. I think that there are barriers to other people coming and we need to identify and break down those barriers so that they actually are engaged, that we do hear the value of their opinions, and that this community does start to reflect. So I think there's a lot mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think some of what you're talking about, about when people are not in spaces, it can't just be them speaking up time and time again for themselves. That's exhausting. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. And so one of the terms that we can use around that is allyship. Uh, another one is solidarity, so, so really being there with people and trying to be an active, a participant in, in identifying barriers and naming them so that people don't always have to. Um, and then I like to even go beyond that to like hope and spirit or like how do we actually actively work alongside people who are impacted to break down systems of oppression that prevent them from being um, able to participate in democracy that make them it more difficult for them to to be active in their communities in the ways that I think we need them to be because we want those more valuable perspectives. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your talk. It's really, really interesting. I love what you said about democracy too, that was great. I'm just wondering, could you tell us where the statue is now and if it's on the council's plan at all to bring this issue forward as to what to do with the statue? Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned as well, maybe I misheard you, but I think you said the process of taking the statue down may have been hurtful to some mm -hmm. local indigenous nations. Could you speak to that or correct me if I'm wrong? Mm -hmm. So again, like I said, um, all the media, like C all CTV, Global, CBC, all ran at least three stories about this. And our local paper ran three stories plus multiple op-eds and opinion pieces on this. And every time a new story came out, I would get a range of uh, emails that were uh, had everything from very offensive racism to lightly coded racism. And then the stories online would have all sorts of sort of these racist flare-ups. So if, for people in the community who are racialized or indigenous, having to watch that conversation about them take place was incredibly harmful. Um, so that's what I would say about that, but as far as what a better process for that would be, I don't know, because I think that having a public discussion about it, we would have just had that, and so if, if indigenous people want to come and tell us about the statue, and indigenous people did come and tell me about the statue, they told me the statue harmed them. Um, so ask for, for me to say, we'll come again and come to this official process, I think where you might be subjected to this kind of racism would be even more harmful. So I'm not sure that there's a process without harm because we do live in a racist society, particularly against uh, indigenous folks. Um, the statue is just currently in storage. Um, and part of that motion was to have a public consultation about um, about what we should do with the statue and how we want it presented. And I think part of it that's built into that is also having more information. So I've, I've brought forward a number of motions on reconciliation. Um, one is truth before reconciliation, that the community, council, city staff, people, the police department, uh, we need to better understand the impacts of colonization in residential schools. I don't think that we have anywhere close to a base level of understanding, the same understanding. I think that people are very widely, and I think that it's part of our work, part of my work as a settler, to continuously learn. So, but I do not think that having some people who do not understand what residential schools, I mean, we have a senator who says publicly that residential schools were good. So I don't think having those people give an opinion on where the bank these actually should go is useful to anyone, and in fact, it is more harmful. So I think that those conversations have to be really carefully curated and built. Um, 
to, to eliminate, or not to eliminate, but to lessen harm. Um, but I think that what the city is doing right now is we're engaging in dialogues with the different nations that I mentioned. And as we have a better relationship with them and understand what reconciliation would look like to them, I think we can begin to have a more of a community conversation that includes a lot of, um, a lot of education for folks who don't, who don't know. Um, but I think just going out and asking for people's opinion is not, is not perfect. Good. Um, as a comparison, because I'm curious, do you have much more information on uh, how the Simon Fraser statute decision kind of came across, and if there was maybe a backlash for that, because you said that was a council decision? Do you, you mean the one, uh, like this one? Oh uh, yeah, the one, yeah, that one. Yeah, so, um, so no, because it never got, it never got done. This was the extent of the intervention on it, was it got this red line? Oh, okay, sorry, okay. yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sorry, uh, that maybe wasn't clear, but she never intended to move the bus at all. Um, she just wanted to cut a piece out of it to sort of symbolize that lowering, and then, yeah, floated down the Fraser River. So, um, to be honest, I never even, went, I was not council at the time, and I never even heard about this. The first I heard about this was uh, when I was invited to the dialogue session with the artist. Um, so, no, there was basically no backlash about it at all. Um, but I guess when the community saw her touching the statue, they thought, oh, what, what are you doing to our statue? But, just makes me curious that we might have to be more creative in how we get rid of the statues and different pieces, um, like like the painting of the hands, which was I guess the person was arrested, mm -hmm. um, because yeah, no one pays attention until there's a decision. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, I feel like for sure not getting other chemists here, we have to base that backlash constantly when there's a story. Mm -hmm. and I think that that media piece really where people get like some reason to uh, to take part of the action and mm -hmm. the stuff. I mean, I guess it's pretty popular to pick on the media right now, but um, <laughs> I mean, I guess it was, I guess what frustrated me about that was that there wasn't even, they didn't even consider that the motion had a public consultation thing in it. Um, and it, I don't think it's particularly interesting to ask if it's a racing history. I mean, I think that this has been well, well talked about that it's not a racing history. Um, but again, the media really, really simplifies the story. And that again, um, sparks a lot of outrage from people. So. I just wish that the media um, took some responsibility for the way that they covered stories like that and the harm that it inflicts. Um, my, my personal place of frustration is that New Westminster was also the first city in Canada to respond to the murder of the missing Indigenous Women Report. Um, and no media covered that. And I, in fact, made a point of reaching out to every single uh, journalist who contacted me about the Bedby statue, asking if they were interested in that story, and none of them were. So it, I get that their you know, media is in a constrained environment and they're doing what they can with less, but I do think that we all have to take responsibility for the ways in which our actions harm um, marginalized folks, and I don't think that the media has any analysis on that right now. And when they run these very simplistic stories, it, it sparks this outrage. I was wondering if I could just to follow up on, um, so you mentioned how this uh, artist, um, the First Nations in the, in the area kind of um, didn't really, they were concerned they didn't uh, ask for this uh, this pedestal to be thrown down the river and, and they were like, oh, the artist is going to do whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas um, you also said the Begbie statue was removed because, in large part, because the First Nations, the Indigenous community came to this, the council and said, mm -hmm. we want you to do this, to remove the statue because it's hurtful. Um, so if the Indigenous peoples hadn't come to council, then would the council maybe not have pursued that because it wasn't coming from the indigenous community. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess what role do settlers have to, um, uh, to when they're thinking about challenging colonial monuments, um, mm -hmm. to, you know, if they do that without um, consultation with indigenous communities, then are they, is that just a, another colonialist mm -hmm. kind of move on, on, on the territories? Yeah, it's a real, that's a really good question, I think with a lot of nuance in it. Um, to be clear, the Silpati Nation never formally came to the New Westminster City Council. They made the comments publicly in the media. And so that was some of the debate at the council table was about whether or not this was a correct process. Is should they ask us to remove it formally? Should we engage with them on it? All those things. And I think the problem is, is again, we are asking them time and time again to expend what they what their limited resources are and also their energy in confronting the impacts of colonization and racism. Um, that is emotionally draining as well as draining on resources. So the fact that they had publicly stated that they wanted the statue removed, I thought was enough 
Some of my colleagues do not agree. They thought that we had to go to them and ask for them to engage with us. But for me, asking Indigenous folks to come with us and engage with us in our terms is really just digging into colonialism. Um, as far as that, I think that's a really difficult question to answer because I think that allies do need to step up. We can't ask Indigenous people, we can't ask disabled people, we can't ask queer people, whatever it is, to continue to do work um, and do emotional labor. Um, so I think that allies do need to step up, but I think they have to be careful about stepping in front um, because I think that there's a lot, just like the Silk Road Team Nation called for us, if you just looked it up, you could see that there was a public call to do this. We don't have to create new actions on their behalf. There is a lot of things that, uh, for example, disabled people have said that they need, um, that we just continue not to hear. The straw ban is an example, where disabled people have said repeatedly that a straw ban harms them. And then people are like, let's do a straw ban. And, and, and disabled people say, that harms us. So we've said it so many times. We just need to listen to what marginalized people are already telling us. And then I think take those actions so that we do not need to generate any list of actions. There's a lot of allyship that's already been asked for that we have not been able to. Questions? How do you want to engage on these kind of issues? Like, if you are not Indigenous, what role would you want to play? And what, what role do you think you should play in this kind of dialogue? I think, uh, as a settler, but one who considers himself an ally, um, I think the best I can do is try to dialogue with other settlers. Uh, let me give you a, a current example. I was at Herman's just a little while ago, and in the blurb um, about being on unceded land that precedes most events nowadays, um, there was a, an addition. It was that we were uninvited guests on unceded land. And that, that was new, and a lot, the people I was with were taken aback by it. Did I really hear that? Did she really say that? And it took me a while to, to think about it myself. And on the way home as we talked about it, I thought, no, that, it makes total sense. It's like you were saying before, when you say it's unceded land, that means it's stolen land. Well, how could you see it any other way then? But it's, it's hard for a lot of people still with colonialized minds to take that perspective. So I think as when, when you ask what we can do, I think personally that's what I see as my role is just to uh, t dialogue with other settlers and to educate myself as much as I can and try to have conversations that try to help other settlers slowly you know, understand these other perspectives. Can you repeat the question? Oh, I don't know again. Um, <laughs> I think I guess it's how how what role do you think you have in this kind of dialogue, and what part would you want to play in it? I on my mind right now is what well, Susan, but um, specifically the actions in Victoria here the last few weeks and the legislature that started small. Um, my partner is friends with some of the people organizing that, and the way they started out like you know, behind the scenes was. Um, she's not indigenous settler, um, but they really elevated voices, knowing, knowing which actions through their history that it's the non indigenous people that will be on the front line, and the ones where it's, you know, like this is uh, what we're going to do. So the uh, indigenous youth went and locked themselves to the gates, and it started small, and then more people showed up one day, and then more the next, and by the end, there were hundreds and hundreds. And like the last night, uh, I was there, I had to work in the morning, but people were bringing their backpacks and stuff with uh, sleeping bags at like 11 p.m. And people that I see, like, oh, you're a barista at this coffee shop, like I've seen you around the city here. People that weren't activists before, and it was really inspiring to see 
all these non-Indigenous allies with, um, and not trying to take the stand, just like there for safety. They listened to the call that went out on social media uh, and followed that. And so what my role is, I think, is, is doing that. It's doing selfless, uh, selfless as I can, like actions to show up and use my body and my privilege when needed because the cops are less likely to shut that down if um, it's not all indigenous people like that, you know, at something like that or other situations. Mm -hmm. um, for myself, as a racialized woman, I really feel it's all about lifting up the uh, Biden Hawk or the Biden Hawk community uh, because there's not enough of us as racialized and indigenous peoples. So we must come together and save and support spaces first and foremost so we can have those conversations amongst ourselves so we can lift each other up and not engage in our own violence within our own communities. Because once we lift up, we can rise up. At the same time, I'm a strong proponent for community bridging because we have two shores. So we have indigenous and racialized peoples on one shore and white people on the other shore. So how do we build those bridges that are conducive, that are respectful, that are diplomatic? Because it takes strength and courage for people to meet up on the bridge. So I really feel that's the other way that we can bring allyship. Um, but it's also interesting, Martin Luther King said this, I can't do it justice, but he said the most dangerous white person in America during the civil rights movement was a white liberal. And we can switch that up and we can say the most dangerous white person um, in DC, Victoria Vancouver, is a white social justice warrior. It's similar connotations, so that's where one has to dismantle and decolonize our minds. But on a positive note, it's really about bridging and working together in our relationship. But first and foremost, begin to be witnesses and to listen to indigenous voices, to listen, listen to racialized voices. That is where the greatest change is going to happen, because it hasn't happened to the extent that it needs to happen, is to listen. And I think it's an interesting point, like the West Hamilton protest is a really interesting example of, um, of solidarity and it seems to be quite effective right now. Um, and at the same time, like I've also had an incident of sort of being involved in that as well, where there was, you know, solidarity for the West Hamilton, but also some microaggression racism was going on. And um, just thinking about the way that we show up in spaces and the room that we take up, like who speaks first? Um, are we grabbing the mic the first chance we get? Um, are we naming other activists? Like, I, you know, I really try and make a point of naming people that I organize things with because I do not do things on my own. Um, but too often we invisibilize people behind the scenes and just take credit for, for others' thoughts or, or work. Um, but I think that's that's a really good point of like, how do we how do we bridge these these yeah you know, like people who want to be allies, but often in their allyship actually might be harming in other ways that they're not aware of. Um, but also amplifying voices that we don't often get to hear um, and promoting their leadership and their wisdom and their lived experience and their expertise and all sorts of things. Yeah. Are there comments or questions? Will you um, get me? <laughs> After your experience as a counselor, what do you mean? Well, so that's a really interesting question. So I have so much to say about this. <laughs> as soon as I was elected, um, a bunch of racialized people were having a bit of a what's next off, where it's like, no, you're running for MLA, you're running for MP, you're running for mayor. And I was like, I cannot hold all these positions at the same time. Um, and, and nor do I even necessarily want to. I think um, one of my friends, Rhiannon, who I mentioned, uh, who's must be, and she was uh, the first First Nations school trustee elected to uh, city of Delta. And she was not re-elected. And one of the things she said to me after I was elected and she was not re-elected was, just so you know, incumbency does not work the same way for you. Mm. And I thought, oh dear, <laughs> that's probably true. That you know, especially in local government, that once you're elected, getting elected the first time is the hardest, and then incumbency uh, means a lot of people can usually sit in positions for way longer than they probably should. 
Um, but that may not be true for different folks. Um, and we've seen that just from like white women even that people don't like them when they ask for, for uh, power. I guess what I would say is that if I'm planning on running again, then that means that I would probably be much safer. And I wouldn't do things like remove statues. Um, because it's not very popular with the voting class. Like, so sort of those folks we were talking about, um, the sort of affluent homeowners who feel very entitled to come to City Hall um, and ask for a lot of things or engage in all the processes, they come out and vote, no doubt about it. And I can't say I've endeared myself to them very well so far. Um, but as far as uh, having a lot of like young women, uh, racialized folk come up to me and say like, thank, thank you for speaking the way you do, thank you for raising the issues the way that you do. Um, that means a lot to me, but it does not, um, I guess what I'm saying is that if you are running for re-election, you're making very safe choices, and I don't want to make safe choices, so I don't even want to think about re-election. Um, I'd rather do things that are tougher and braver, but unpopular, because they're good, so, um, yeah, we'll see. But, uh, but it is interesting that here in Victoria, when the statue was removed, there was an election coming up yeah. shortly thereafter, and there was some concern that the mayor and those who supported that would not get re-elected, and mm -hmm. most of them are, many of the councillors did get elected, and now we have a more progressive council than we've had in a long time, right? So yeah. it might not have been safe, but um, yeah. if people were still re-elected. Yeah, I think we need more courageous leadership that better represents our community, because if we continue to go that way, we'll continue to elect those same folks. Um, and I guess the big question is always like, are those people racialized who are re-elected? Because um, I do think that they are more vulnerable to, to being blamed for anti-racist acts, blamed for anti-racist acts. Um, and again, I don't think incumbency works the same way for them as it might for, for certain people. So yeah, I think, I think that, that um, we have to find other folks and we have to um, make other people see them in the community and that might lead to better voter turnout and more representative um, elected officials, but it's a risk. And it feels like a risk and it's, it's painful sometimes and it's hard, um, I'm sure my friend Mark would say the same thing, sometimes it's hard to recommend this position um, for other folks because it is a bit, um, painful and so something that I've uh, talked a little bit about is that people have told me I'm divisive and abrasive and I think a little bit about if I'm abrasive then I'm rubbing against these sharp edges so they're a little less sharp for the next racialized person who's in my seat. Hmm. Yeah. Alright, well let's thank uh, Nadine again. <laughs> talk in the series on the spring. Um, on April 2nd, um, geographer Derek Alderman is coming, uh, um, he's a professor at the University of Tennessee, and he's speaking about uh, more than just an urban travel guide, the Negro Motorist Green Book as archive map and memorial. Mm -hmm. So hopefully you all can, uh, can make it there. Uh, Derek's a really uh, interesting guy. A lot of his work looks at the, the naming of streets after Martin Luther King Jr. And so, uh, so he's done a lot of work on commemoration and politics and memory, so hopefully you can all now then. So anyway, have a good night everyone. Mm -hmm. See you next time. Mm -hmm.